Hi, thanks for coming out to join us. I'm Sierra, and I'm here with Kent and Jordan. Jordan. And they're going to talk to us about, and BB King is on. Hola, Hola amigos y amigas, como están? And uh, so, we will go ahead and start, and um, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them into the question, and I will answer them. And if I can't, or they're a question for them, then I will wait till they take a breath. And This time it's different, too, because we can all see. Yeah, exactly. And our voodoo doll did get yanked. Uh, sorry, yeah. marketing decision. Just what do I do that happens. Murphy. BB, have you heard the first semester Spanish love song? If not, you should look it up on YouTube. Unchecked. All right, so let's roll. Okay, here we go. Get rid of that one. Awesome. So, guys, we were just uh, remember to look at the camera, kids. Thank you. Sorry, just <laughs> getting slides in the right place. Okay. Thanks, Brenda. We just got back from HackWest in Salt Lake City, where we did a great talk on uh, wireless. And the interesting thing at uh, HackWest is we were going to do a red talk, a red team talk about wireless, and tell how to to pwn on wireless, just like has always been done. And uh, we quickly realized that we were going to have a redundant talk. So uh, about a day before the talk, we went ahead and changed everything and did talk about it. Rewrote the whole slide deck in yeah. the middle of the night until, you know, hackers go to sleep at, what, 2, 3 a.m.? Yeah, Something to that effect. It was a late night in Salt Lake City. It was awesome. Point being, we got a blue team wireless uh, talk out of it. And we kind of created some slides that will go through. Obviously, when you watch these slides, you'd be like, wow, this looks like it started as a red team talk. And it did. Uh, so yeah, we're going to talk about wireless. and. From a, a lot more than wireless, I think, but we'll, we'll get it there. Is, it is, but it's all connected. And one of the things about wireless, you, when you do a pen test, it's like it's not trusted. Like there's always a win for red team because there's always some method, always some vector to get through it. Or something bleeding edge, some new trick or major or vulnerability, not, something that's going to allow someone to break in. Or not new trick. That's really old. old. That old still trick. works. Old trick. Yeah. So looking at it, we kind of wanted to talk about that and maybe think about a better way. And our better way is just to consider wireless and any infrastructure to be untrusted. And if you look at it from that perspective, you get a different take on it. And the red team wins get a lot more difficult because, yeah, they might be able to get on your wireless network, but are they really going to be able to do much? So let's uh, get started and talk about it. So the point being, red will win consistently over time, but blue, blue teamers, we can win this war. Absolutely. So we're going to start out real quick. And, and if you guys didn't know, these guys both used to be our own, our very own blue team. Yeah. And now they're, they've. We they've, still contribute to the blue team. They now do, I'm purple. They do, they do. But, um, we asked D-Rock to stop by and visit, but he didn't seem very enthused. <laughs> so this, it's He's a new hiding. thing. You have to be pushed into webcasting, so welcome. <laughs> no, it's awesome. OK, so we're going to go over some of these technologies really quick. We're not going to talk about wet because it's really old and it's broken and it's been. Nobody uses broken. it anymore, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they still do. But anyway, so let's, let's move forward. Than Facebook, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of Facebook, all right. So, <laughs> excuse me. You're getting Cambridge Analytica. Oh, oh. Whoa, 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 whoa. So many hacks. WPA2 tools. is the new web. It is. <laughs> it is all, Might as well be. So, we're looking at the hacking tools, and they're all pretty old. They've been around for a while, they've been tweaked, and they work really awesome. And so, yeah, should we run through a quick demo or a quick review of how we crack networks? Yeah. Capture handshakes. Crack handshakes, pwnage. Yeah, and that's, Done, that's right? typically what it is. It's really quick. And Using really a, the same series of uh, air replay to dump users, arrow dump to capture packets, and then air crack to uh, recover keys. Yeah, awesome. Or hash cat. Yeah. Yeah, true. That works. So it's probably awesome faster too. Because it just works. And the best case scenarios you have for Blue Team are really long, pre shared keys. And we'll talk about that. But, uh, you know, there are some new tools out there as well. Um, stuff like Crack came out last year and kind of scared everybody. But when you look at it from that perspective, there's already stuff out there that helps prevent it. And manufacturers came out with, with the updates that prevented it. And it's one of those things where you have to keep your stuff updated. And from the blue team side, it becomes a lot less uh, worrisome. So unfortunately, red teams can still win. They've got a lot of tools out there. Yeah, a lot of well-documented tools and Cracks. But again, as Cracks, uh, mentioned there. Just keep your stuff updated. It matters. So while so, we were in Salt Lake City, sorry, Jordan. No, go ahead, man. Right. So when we were in Salt Lake City, uh, Sierra took us on a six-mile walk downtown. 
But I tip you on it. You Man, can't. marketing is the worst. They are totally. <laughs> our our feet hurt so bad. Here's the thing. Well, while we were shopping, or while Sierra was shopping, Jordan and I were carrying a shopping, uh, I was working. shopping bag for Sierra. <laughs> <laughs> we were carrying a payload with us, a Raspberry Pi. And uh, is it really a payload? No, we, well, we were doing recon. We'll talk yeah. about postcard protocol in a little bit. So but. we were we were looking for things. Um, specifically all the SSIDs and, and stations and radios we could find. And uh, in our six mile walk, we found 5,262 radios. Now those are not stations that are connected to an access point. These are actual access points. Um, of those, 67 were running web. So yeah, and that. then 1,200 open networks. What are we saying here? These networks are clearly vulnerable. How many and maybe what percentage of those open networks have something laying behind them that shouldn't be left unattended? so to speak. None of them. None of them, None in of theory, them. right? <laughs> How many have client isolation enabled? Simple functions that might allow a, a little better security. WPA3 might solve this problem as it rolls out, but that's that's too many open networks. That's too many web networks. It's, it's senseless. And this is standard and indicative of wireless deployments across, uh, I would assume, the planet. I mean, I've never captured packets in the UK or Japan, but I assume this is pretty indicative of Absolutely. So the reason we did this is we kind of wanted to be a precursor to our talk. So we wanted to get out there and see how many open Wi-Fi networks we could find uh, for Salt Lake City and for the downtown area where we were actually speaking at. Obviously, then we did some analytics on it and found the top, uh, I don't know, was it five? Uh, ten, yeah, you ran analytics on top ten. open Wi-Fi networks. And then we're going to use that later on um, <clears throat> when we go into more detail about what we did with those. So kind of moving forward, that was just kind of a, a side jam we did. We wanted to do some walking and definitely got it in. So yep. that's kind of what we discussed there. Jordan, go ahead and slip that slide there. We're on the w, WPA and WPA2. Um, okay, so here's the thing about this. Those tools that exist just make, make WPA and WPA2 uh, Secure, right? <laughs> okay, so here's what you need to know about WPA2 pre-shared keys. As long as it's really, really, really ridiculously long, you're okay because of the math that's associated with it, but only kind of okay because there's still ways to steal PSKs uh, for WPA2. And ultimately, when you make a big loop here, we still break WPA and WPA2. We either do it by stealing pre-shared key or we do it just by cracking the four-way handshake and, and cracking it that way. So what is ridiculously long? The pre-shared key. Yeah, no, the I mean the binary. Oh, well, it's up to 63 characters in length, so right? So characters. that means we can't crack your key with our cracker, right? I mean, the mathematics of key space just become ridiculous at around, I don't know, 13, 14, pretty yeah. much infeasible at 18, 20. And Unless you use a 10-digit phone number. Then. Yeah, well. well. <laughs> we have another talk about that, so you can listen to, <clears throat> to why not to use uh, phone numbers for your pre-shared keys. It's really great for houses, though, because you can, like, Go online, do some OSINT, find out what someone's phone number is, and then try that with their pre-shared key, and it might work. Uh, math is hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, math is very hard. It is. So we the key know. thing here is WPA and WPA2, yeah, they're out there. Yeah, they work to secure your network, but ultimately, ultimately, we can still crack them. And we're either going to do it by getting the four-way handshake. Close your questions. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to do it by the four-way handshake, or we're going to do it by stealing it. And how do we steal it? Well, there's multiple ways. Um, do you want to think on the next slide we can kind of discuss yeah, that? Yeah, you ready for that? Yeah, I'm ready for that. Let's do this. I don't know what I just clicked on there. Khalil. So what if we just steal the thing? I was looking for a uh, rubber ducky so that I could pop it in here and you'd see some magic happening with PowerShell dumping clear text WPA keys. So what if we just steal your keys? doesn't matter how long they are, right? They're just laying around. Uh, one of the pen tests we were on, they gave us authorization to touch all the laptops. We found a laptop, stole the laptop, convoluted the laptop, and stole the keys. Done. Like. You lose. So then what? Game over. Red team wins again. Maybe. Have you allowed corporate access with those keys? Is it good enough? No, it's not. Convoot still exists? Convoot Man still works. Exists. <laughs> Didn't we demo on your Mac? Yeah, we did. Oh, <laughs> that's terrifying. Stop we, we it. Have, there's a blog post it. about that. And here's the thing. Uh, we have this laptop that we didn't know the password for. And the first thing we thought of is, well, let's just convert it. <laughs> because it just works. So it, yeah, it's it's one of those things that encrypt your laptops. Yes, exactly. And systems, all so of them. We have a 63 character PSK, but ultimately it doesn't matter because we can steal them using these tools. And Jordan raises an excellent point. If you have an encryption hard drive, that encrypted hard drive that's requiring a, a key when you boot before it load the operating system, uh, Comboot becomes a lot less effective. 
Oh. In fact, completely inert. That one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and by that last, we mean not at all. But your right. uh, bash bunny and such will still work just fine. So, so where are we? Shall we review? Uh, Red Team won. Uh, they got connected, and they downloaded everything in your corporate network and won and password sprayed and pivoted, and you lost all that fun stuff, as usual. So stop making us register would like to ask, wouldn't an off-port mitigate most attacks against WEP and WPA, too? Uh, kind of, except the first thing I try when I join a guest network on your network is if I can still create maybe an SSH tunnel outbound, because that's not always filtered. Sure, you might redirect me somewhere, but have you given me just enough to get out? Maybe I can get out on port 80. My SSH servers are configurable, and if I can proxy through that, then, well, guess what? Too late. So what does a red team do when that, once they get connected? Uh, pivot. So let's, yeah, let's go ahead and move forward, and we'll talk about that. Well, you haven't mentioned your analogy, which I love. Remember, wireless networks are akin to uh, putting an Ethernet jack on your front door, or even like the neighbor's front door or the neighbor's Maybe bedroom. your parking lot or yeah. leaving an Ethernet jack in your neighbor's house. How do you feel about that? Trust your wireless? Or the sleeve Sierra? across the street? No, <laughs> I'm terrified. Should be. So, where are we? Oh, it says 504. Absolutely, the best information security class in the 21st century. Taught by the best boss ever. Best boss. Thought leader? Oh. <laughs> Yeah, he is that, but he would be mortified if he knew we were here talking about him. <laughs> Absolutely. So again, we assume compromise. We have to. In all situations, we have to assume the red teams will win because they always win. They always find a way to win. So in SANS 504, they teach you how to pivot. And we ask questions like, where am I? Who am I? And then we start up. We're looking for NMAP and looking at LMNR and BetterCap. And we're doing things like, is internet only? Are we as looking for outbound sockets, endpoints, firewalls, you know, the network and awareness, we're gonna build the network map and we're gonna pivot all throughout it. Have we triggered incident response by now? Are you, have you identified that your key got compromised and somebody got onto your network through legit means? I mean, how, how do you capture things like that? Absolutely. So, Especially if it was legit means. Yeah, right? Stolen laptop, lost creds, authenticated system. Trouble. So, next up. Net result, what happened? Well. Now the blue team was owned, and the red team authenticated, and the red team still won. They pivoted through the entire network. And at this point, we might as well just give the red team the keys because they've got it. They've pivoted the entire thing and downloaded everything. And where does that leave us? Well, we've got this thing around here that's paralyzing paranoia. Um, you know, that 63-character pre-shared key is really tough to have to type in every time. But uh, it becomes really paralyzing for staff. And it, you have one of those things that you have to balance. You have to balance how secure you want something versus the usability of it. You don't want to reduce the productivity of your environment because you had to raise security. And you need to find that balance in doing that. And a lot of people talk about that and they're like, no, no, we can't do that. We just, we can't. We have too many users that don't understand. Just like they can't type in a long password. Just like they can't type in a 63 character pre shared key. <laughs> Right. Or password. And we I totally get it. And when you start looking at it, you can say, well, well, we use passphrases, so it's easier to remember. I'm like, great, that's a start. But ultimately, you still have that balancing act. And what we kind of want to talk about today is you can make it really secure without inconveniencing your users so much that you can't get productivity out of it. So that's what we're going to look at. So I don't think I'll, uh, I'm going to comment on Philippe's comment here before we move on. And there's there is a reason that Microsoft does not allow the push of pre-shared keys through GPO. Can you clarify that? Well, you have to store them somewhere to start off um, with. Yeah, I do not believe that Microsoft allows WPA2 keys to be pushed. Now, they allow you to create wireless profiles and drop 802.1x configurations on your supplicants, for supplicant configuration, supplicant being your clients on the network. Um, but it allows fine-grained configuration if you're using 802.1x for wireless. It does not allow the pushing of WPA2 keys through GPO. Awesome. Okay, so next up. So let's talk about that. What if there was that different way? And there is. You know, we've you hear the things like, well, it's too hard. We've always done it that way, and we don't want to do something different because we have always done it that way. And the key thing we want to hear is there's a different way of doing it. It's not necessarily more difficult, but it is different. And you have to be able to be open to that different idea. And when you start looking at things that are different, you have the ability to leverage that in different ways. Now, we are going to make a couple caveats here. 
Um, we are not pro-proprietary or pro-open source. Some of the stuff we're going to talk about is both. Some of them is proprietary. And we want to make that clear that you can do these feature sets with either. You can design a network that uses either an entire solution that uses either or both. And we just want to point out that we've got some products here today. Um, we're not necessarily uh, going to, well, we're not going to sell them. Um, get that clear out of the way. We are not resellers of any um, this commercial just product to be some besides of the solutions our own. That we demoed <laughs> in this environment. So we also want to point out that we are pro-security and pro-awareness and pro-productivity. We are not out there to make everything really difficult for everyone, despite some of our reports might make it seem that way because that's just Absolutely. how you be secure. Yeah, and John's point about antivirus as well, how's your antivirus been doing over the last oh, 15 to 20 years? It's making someone a lot of money. How's your firewall been operating over the last 20 years? It's, it's pretty much toilet paper to us, right? Where we can go in and it doesn't, we don't care what kind of firewall we have, you have. We don't care about your antivirus because it's, it's a short speed bump, never a roadblock. But, but the point is here, there's a different way to do things. And it's time for blue teams to step up their game and move in the direction of doing things differently because what we're doing now is not working. And when Jordan says toilet paper, he doesn't mean you don't need it because you do. You definitely want to. But like John says, it doesn't matter what kind you use. We're at the end of yes. the day. You, I've yes. got next gen toilet paper at home, so <laughs> I have next next gen. Chokes on you. We got Cisco, says Jason. Double ply next gen. <laughs> All right, so let's get down to it. We already know that the red team is going to break your web or your WPA. Wait, did I go two slides there? Oh, you're good. Oh, okay. Sorry. You're good. So we know that they're going to break in your wireless. And the point at that point becomes, oh, how do we do it then? What, what are we going to do to make our area secure? We want to be, we want to give our ability for our users to connect to wireless and be able to do their jobs. And whether it be a conference room or the coffee shop or the parking lot, whatever, <laughs> whatever it is, we want our users to be secure and also be able to be productive. And we want to give them bandwidth for their apps. Absolutely like the iOS updates that are going to download every time a phone connects to their wireless network. And don't tag your broadband. It's great. Should we check out our phone and see if it's Did downloading updates? Oh, no. <laughs> Did you Please see no. that, what BB King said about Xfinity, how they like put a different one on so that Xfinity customers also get free internet from you? Yes, I did know yes. that. Yes, I've seen this. Yes, which is definitely. It's really interesting, right? We did this one the first time uh, we spoke at B-Sides in Denver. You kids, get off my lawn. We we found <laughs> Xfinity everywhere. There's literally, a, I don't know, 100,000 Xfinity networks because they dropped them on their modem. So then you rent a modem for me. Uh, I'm not going to name that organization, but the Xfinity Wi-Fi maintaining organization. They just they drop it on their modems so that everywhere you go, you're redirected through their infrastructure and networks and data may or may not be collected about you or whatever. Xfinity is awesome because you can also make it a, a vector platform if you're on a red team really easily. All right, so let's talk about infrastructure. Uh, and what, if you look at uh, what's called uh, protected management frames or managed frames, uh, management frames protected <laughs> protection. Close. Or 802.11ac2016 or 802.11w2009, they did something really interesting, uh, which was they're going to either encrypt or provide an integrity check on all management frames. Now, from wireless and everything I just said, what does it all mean? It means that you can no longer try to spoof a deauthentication or deassociation frame uh, for for clients. <laughs> Why that's a big deal is it means you can no longer go into an environment and say, I'm going to go de off 100 clients and wait for them to reconnect so I can grab that four-way handshake, uh, which is awesome because now it means that if you're listening for pre-shared keys based via handshakes, you have to be able to be there before the person connects or when they connect, not just de-authenticate everybody and hope that they uh, re-authenticate and give you their four-way handshakes. So those are things that have already been in the mix. Again, that was 802.11w2009. So this is stuff that came out in 2009. Yet when you talk about Red Team Wireless, they're still talking about deauthenticating, spoofing deauthentication frames to get everybody off the network and hope that they can get a four-way handshake. And these are features that have, again, W2009, Cisco did that before that. And it's now actually in mainstream, 802.11ac 2016 meant that anyone any device that's wireless that is 802.11 AC certified after 2016 includes the features for managed frame protection. 
here's the thing. If you buy a Linksys router at Walmart for, you know, whatever, 100 bucks, they're going to have that feature if it's AC 2016 certified. The problem with it is Linksys is smart, and they'll say, we're going to have these features, but it might not work with all legacy devices. So because of that, we're going to disable it because we don't want all those support calls with people that can't connect their printer from 2004. Printers. Yeah. Right. Right. Printers. <laughs> So it's there, but it's disabled by default, and you can go enable it. Now that said, I'm not suggesting anybody use Linksys uh, access point for your for your enterprise network. Don't, but you can. Don't. <laughs> All right. So there's other features too, like client isolation. Client isolation. So hang on, let's stop real quick. Yeah. We just want to we want to make clear now that we have transitioned from blue team to, or I apologize, from red team to blue team. This is stuff that you can start implementing, making sure it's across your network at right now to make your lives better. And the irony is this stuff has been around for just as long as these hacking tools have been around. Um, it's just they're not as well known because there's a lot less focus on that blue team perspective than there is the red team. So uh, the next bullet point here, client isolation. Talk about that if you have two uh, devices connected to the same access point. Are you able to cross talk between them and have those two devices communicate at the same time to each other without the access point? And in most cases you can. There are features turned on that you can prevent that whether it be by crypt uh, cryptography or by uh, integrity checks, that those two devices cannot talk to each other. Now, on the red team side, there are ways around that. Uh, specifically, Wi-Fi tap will try to spoof keys and, and get around that as well. But again, that comes back to those protected management. And products. client and AP Max, right? Absolutely. If I fake that I'm a client or an AP, I can talk to another device that I yes, maybe didn't absolutely. There's to. The point being there is those features exist already, but they're not necessarily enabled. In fact, they're probably not. Even a Netgear solution will support client isolation. So uh, I assume that it is on most. It may be termed differently depending on vendor or proprietary implementation of that, but most devices support client isolation. So Jordan, tell me, why do I need a wireless controller? It's a big well, deal. you don't need a wireless controller, but it sure makes your life easy. Single pane of glass management and infrastructure, right? And what we did with our little deployment here is stand up tunneled interfaces. Those tunneled interfaces allow us to do um, ACLs and, and decision making at our firewall instead of on our switched infrastructure, right? A common wireless deployment is to put people on a VLAN and then figure out the VLAN wherever it's going and routing across the network and then ACL there. That's That works as well, but for us, when we deploy a wireless network, we're gonna put it in behind a tunnel and then route and make decisions with our firewall. And so kind of get the idea of what's going on there. A lot of cases when you're used to using an access point with VLAN ACLs, what you're doing is you're putting the access point up and then you're telling clients based off some sort of criteria that you're going to be dumped on VLAN X, which works. But the other technology we're looking at is telling that data back to a router or back to a gateway. And that gateway makes decisions based on the information it has to tell whether or not that client, that wireless client, should have access into what. And thereby, you're actually eliminating that need for VLAN to be tagged all the way back to that access point because you're saying all that information to the gateway and the gateway is making decisions based on that information uh, on whether or not it should have access to things. And which is really important because if you've got 100 access points, that means you have one place that you need to manage ACLs. You don't need to tag VLANs to across all of those different access points. Mm -hmm. uh, looking at your gear, so the access points and the routers, the gateways, all of that needs to be updated and licensed. And if you look at um, over time, you get a vulnerability that comes out and a while later a vendor comes out with a patch. If you don't get that patch, it doesn't mean you're not protected from, that you are protected from the, the vulnerability. You have to keep that stuff updated. And a lot of vendors for equipment will require you to have a valid support contract in order to get the, the patch to the vulnerability. So if you're not licensed, you're not gonna get the patch. And if you don't get the Smart patch, that. yeah, exactly. You're done. <laughs> so, so keep your gear updated, patched. This is so standard across all our pen test reports. You haven't patched your systems or software. It's it's boring to write up and we're tired of writing it up. You, you have to get in front of your executives and convince them that it is time to make sure everything is patched and that it is a policy flowing downward from C-suite and executives level. We lost Kent, <laughs> officially. Here's the thing, you've got to... This system 76 has a power charger that is literally like 10 pounds. It weighs more than the laptop. Why? Yes, but regardless, right? Battery anymore? We're good and we're still up. Okay. So again, we're talking about executive level um, driving of patching systems and making sure that uh, licenses are purchased, applied, and 
uh, are operational. So did you just answer Alex's question? Um, is client isolation separate from VLAN usage? No, VLAN we'll talk about client isolation for just a second before we move on here. And that is basically on an SSID where you have client isolation enabled. Uh, let's say a new client joins up into our SSID. If they reach out for a MAC address that is in the access points CAM tables or you know content addressable memory like our forwarding tables, this MAC address I already know. If a client joins and asks for something in the CAM tables, it is dropped. So it says basically you can't reach any of the MAC addresses I know, and if I don't know you, I'm going to forward onto the network. It's so, it's bypassable, uh, but it is better than not having it. All right, looking forward. So. Next bullet here is untrusted perimeters and, and what that means. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more, but essentially we are telling you again, stop trusting wireless. If you're on a connected wireless network, don't trust it. Stop saying that it's a trusted network that should access your servers and other workstations. It's not. It's just an endpoint. You need to make sure that you consider it just an endpoint, just a node. It's not secure because it's connected. Uh, also talking about segregated multi-layered networks. If you've got two sets of organizational units, they don't need to be on the same LAN. And on top of that, firewalls should probably be enabled on all of those devices. Yes, all of them, the workstations. And even more so, if you've got the accounting department and the marketing department, they probably shouldn't be able to talk to each other. Uh, just the same, what uh, systems need to access the servers? Do the servers need to access all of the workstations, et cetera? These are all things that should be taken into consideration, yet in the larger scope, really don't have that much to do with wireless, but has everything to do with wireless. Absolutely. And then LMNR, right? So we've compromised your keys. We got in now. Why hasn't the blue team disabled LMNR? Is it a political conversation? They're struggling to get by the board, right? Uh, Philippe, we will circle back around to executives and how it matters to an organization. It may not be the shiny new toy, right? LMNR, how long has that been around? And why do I care, right? I'm C-level. I don't know what it is, and I don't care. What does it have to do with me, and does it break everything if we enable this disabling of the feature in GPO, right? Landman, why does it still matter that passwords are stored terribly in Windows infrastructure? SMB, can I just go in and SMB relay and run roughshod over your network? Probably. Oh, say it again, SMB. Say SMB. SMB. You know me! <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Features like WIDS IPS, we love Fortinet's product, their default WIDS IPS profile out of the box kept me from breaking everything. I couldn't do anything with that stuff on. Um, Sims, we got to keep going here. We're, we're running a little behind where we were. So um, Sims, do you have Sims implemented, deployed? Are you capturing logs? Do you do syslogs? Have you created so much noise that nothing is an emergency anymore? Um, AD best practices, have you implemented CAs and TLS across your network? You should, but we're going to keep moving. I can't believe we have action wireless talk. This should be interesting. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the powerful force of protocols and standards. All right. So back to it. 802.11.2009 <laughs> fixed this. It did in 2009, but it wasn't actually implemented anywhere. It was, but it's not very quickly. Uh, even old Cisco gear before 802.11 W2009 had it. The point is, this all came full circle. AC 2016, any device 802.11 AC certified in 2016 or later is going to have this feature. Just enable it. All right. But but hardware refresh cycles, management, how do you implement AC properly across your infrastructure? Are you using it on 2.4 or 5G? Now are we talking about like bringing in consultants to properly deploy AC? I don't think we've deployed 802.11A technologies yet. <laughs> AC exists. <laughs> That's why I can't take cancer. Uh, <laughs> trouble genius for sure. All right. <laughs> no, you just... You say, hey, we want 802.11 AC installed everywhere. Make it happen. Boom. Done. Done. That's all Cisco or Cisco, works. right? Since Cisco's been doing this forever because the things Cisco has done over the last 25 years have generally driven uh, the implementations that become specs, according to IEEE. So, yes. And I'm not saying that you should go uh, refresh a year to 802.11 AC right now and do it all. I'm saying that the features exist. The protocol protocols are slow. But they've kept up enough to look at the what we're doing for attacking and make sure that in the next version they are being implemented in such a way that prevents these type of attacks. And we know that WPA3 is coming out sometime. And what will it have? You know, how is it going to account for these different attack vectors that have been around forever? And again, we're saying that protocol standards, the changes are slow, but they're happening. 
However, proprietary, they look at this stuff and they see, oh, there's a there's a bit of the market here we can corner. We can create a product that's in this spot where the protocols are not matching yet. They're not keeping up. And we can make a product that is proprietary, useful, secure, and we can run with it. But it's not standardized, which means next refresh cycle around, it will probably be different or can be different, or there will be a protocol that matches that meant you no longer have to use that proprietary gear. So those are things that are out there. Point being, protocols and standards are out there. They're just slow, and they're getting there. All right, so again, looking at 802.11 AC 2016, uh, the Cisco protocols that are proprietary, 802.11 W 2009, um, they kept those DAUTH protections and four-way handshakes. They're being able to uh, really protect from DAUTH, but they're not protecting from a four-way handshake. You can still listen, and if you capture a four-way handshake, you can still crack it which is all goes back to that math. If you've got that 63 character password, you're not going to be able to crack it. It just, it's not feasible in the time and the processing power that we have right now. Or on a timed engagement. Absolutely. So that goes back to client isolation. Jordan kind of talked about that in the, the CAM tables and how that works. Point being is if it's available to you, the equipment that you have, you should have it enabled. You don't typically need two devices to talk directly to each other without the access point. All right, absolutely. We're just gonna keep rolling. Awesome, so. Are you patched? <laughs> does, does this matter? Why does this matter, right? And Philippe mentioned again, it is hard to convince executives that patching matters. We write it up every time and we try to deliver it in a meaningful way. Uh, is your organization implementing critical security controls? If they're not, you're at an organization that is probably moving toward getting popped at some point. If your executives are not behind patching, updating, licensing, and maintaining current versions of everything, then you're probably in an organization that's gonna get popped and your reports from us are going to be bathed in red. But patching is so boring. <laughs> and it requires so FTEs. Oh, I mean, we have to hire someone to do that? Pretty much. Oh. But guess what? Crack was fixed with patches on we Android, shiny new toy? on iOS. Yes, it's coming. Crack, wasn't that the shiny new toy? Except it was fixed with updates on all vendor solutions. So all supported and updated yeah. vendor solutions. How's your refresh cycle? Absolutely, and that, that comes to another question. How's your refresh cycle? You know, I've worked for places that said, we're, our refresh cycle is going to match our warranty timeline. So that if something falls out of warranty, we're gonna replace it. That's pretty aggressive, mm -hmm. uh, but that's how they ran. And that consequently meant that there was a lot of gear that was like three years old that was coming back out and getting leased back out and stuff. It's possible, and I think that type of cycle is pretty quick. But again, you just need to keep everything updated. Now, LMNR, MBS, Landman. Okay, here's the deal. These are things that once you're connected to wireless, this is what the red team is going to use to pivot. And uh, I'll let you handle this one, Jordan. You're, you know, sure, absolutely. As soon as we have access to anything, if you're not turning on LLMNR, then you're not trying very hard. Um, NBNS spoofing and, and the response of my system on your network to requests for names, it, it's just an easy win for red teams, which makes it an easy win for blue teams, right? One GPO option for LLMNR. And if this breaks stuff on your network, guess what? You, you seriously need to take a step back and figure out why you're running systems that require NBNS to resolve names, why your DNS infrastructure is broken, why things aren't working. So if you're looking like LMNR, ah, I these are acronyms. Uh, just look back and <laughs> make sure we don't like all the acronyms. We'll make sure that you understand this. But what we want to point out here is that this is a blue team, right? So how difficult is it to shut off LMNR? Well, it's one GPL. Done. One. That's it. And it's done. It, it eliminately eliminates you... all that entire vector of threat. Oh, this is interesting. This is the, that's funny. We have the land manager hash value and then there we go. Ah, awesome. Okay. okay. So there they both are. One is a group policy preference. Anybody ever want the GPP password? A GP, yeah, don't. <laughs> Probably shouldn't anymore, but. Uh, can you say GPP again? Negative. <laughs> <laughs> GPP. <laughs> All right, so the point You're on, welcome. You're welcome. on MBNS, the point is, it's another GPO. It's one option, it's a GPP. It is one option with the registry key. This one's a little more complicated, but it's, it's, more, it's, than, still, it's more than three clicks. You got to type on time it. Review. <laughs> what? I can't do that. <laughs> you can copy and paste. I definitely can't. I definitely <laughs> but, can't. But Sierra, if you had access to group policy management, you could do this too. I could, because you know what? I could Google it. I could follow the directions. Yes. Yeah. So That's what I get. You have an X. So. Done. Oh! But he says it's not a Mac! 
guess not. Right. It's not on a domain either. <laughs> so is there a local security policy for that? Anyway, uh, onward. We're late. Keep oh, going. sorry, sorry, sorry. Keep going. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep going. Wits and whips. Faster. You are. You oh, are. You are doing this. Oh, I kept trying to refresh that. I have to say, you're like you're. It's difficult you're to keep up it. with John. Have you ever tried to keep up with John? I do every time I have a webcast. I'm like, what? <laughs> Okay, hey, Las ahead. Vegas, it's tough. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> Guy owns the town. Uh, George, what, about... what are you doing? Oh, okay, so what about Wiz and Wits? The point here is that we've got all these services. You've got an Active Directory. You've got an access point. You've got a router, a firewall, whatever, a gateway. These are devices that can and should be sending alert logs to some sort of SIM. And the reason why, well, you want to be able to be notified and have IR on things when they happen. And WIDS and WIPs will help you do that. It'll send information uh, health about your wireless network. It'll tell you whether or not someone is trying to de-off your entire network. Hey, D-Rock! And what you can do about that. <laughs> this is a perfect our, time to bring in our Fortinet certified. We're trying to get our yeah. So anyway, this is the default WIDS IPS profile. There is no reason you should not check the box anymore. This stopped literally every standard wireless attack that has been designed for the last 18 years with one checkbox. One checkbox. 18 years and we're still losing. Why aren't yeah, why aren't we winning yet, blue work. teamers? Because they work. All right, so here's the deal. We've got a Ford Gate 61E. It's right over there off screen. And Jordan's logged into it right now, and he's showing that this feature, we're talking about enabling all these feature sets that are WIDS and WIPS. IDS, IPS, yes, check. And being able to put them into a position with one checkbox, that enables all these feature sets that are proprietary mostly, um, and they just prevent all these attacks from occurring. And then logs them checkbox. to the firewall, dumps them to your syslog, which should trigger alerts, which should inform you that someone's sitting in your parking lot trying to break into your network or spoof your clients, done. I mean, we've got so many options here to start winning. And it gives you the ability to react to it using your SIM. So these are feature sets that exist. Again, we're not pro proprietary or pro open source. They just exist in these different formats. Awesome. So uh, the FortiGate 61E and other FortiGates. I would pick it up and show you, but I'm afraid to move it. <laughs> nah, you're all right. It's, all, it's only our internet connection and our <laughs> so demo. Continue. We've got an up to, upcoming demo here in no, just a second here. Go poorly if you did that. Right, right. So somebody uh, popped on a pineapple when we were sitting at uh, Hack West with our little lab where we wanted people to come try and break in. But we operated that lab as if we were a well-defended blue team, right? So we saw the pineapple come online. We configured suppression and suppress that down. pineapple. Done, right? So what the what the Fortinet solution does, this is also proprietary implementation, right? Because Cisco can do this differently. HP Wireless can do this differently. Ubiquity. Fortinet does this by faking the client and sending the pineapple, the deauthentication, as if it were the client. Uh, and then association. Thank you, dissociation. Yeah. And then it also fakes as if it's the pineapple and sends the deauth the other way. Geoassociation. It sends a geoassociation to all of the clients. On As the clients. if it were a two-way stream pretending. Yes. So it was brilliant. I and mean, really. We'll continue doing that. And then the guy was sitting there with his pineapple like, this isn't doing anything. It's not working. <laughs> yes, that's right. It's your pineapple. Yeah, don't go to conferences <laughs> and expect wireless to be a fun time. <laughs> Sorry, Brenda Jones was giving us uh, cues. <laughs> so, uh, was quick review. so this this is another solution, right? You got to have ready. You got to have your your syslog, and you your blue team has to be prepared to review things coming in, identify alerts, and then act on alerts. I do want to say really quickly, uh, we're talking about rogue AP, and we need to find out what, the, what that is really quick. Uh, a rogue AP can be a couple different things. Um, it can be someone with an evil AP uh, that's trying to harvest credentials, um, which will Again, we'll make sure we get that uh, mentioned in the blog post previously uh, mentioned. But a rogue P AP can also be something else. If you've got someone, say, in the marketing department who says, gosh, the internet is so difficult to get on here on wireless, I'm just going to bring my little $20 wireless access point from Walmart and just plug it in. <laughs> IT will never know. Uh, marketing never did that, by the way. <laughs> IT will never know. What the Fortigate is going to do, and again, other products do this too, it's going to constantly scan the network looking for devices that it doesn't recognize. And one of those devices, essentially, at some point, is going to be this Linksys uh, access point or router. When it sees it, it's going to say, oh, hey, I see this. But later on, it's also going to this see. Is Josh in marketing? 
<laughs> it's also going to see uh, that there's new access point available in the air, in the wireless air. And it's going to see that based off all the other access points it has operating in the vicinity. It's going to look at that Linksys and say, I see that it's on the wire, and I see that it's in the air, and devices might be connected to it. And I see that something called MAC adjacency, um, every NIC, every network interface connection has a MAC address. And it's going to say that these are really close together, which is a common thing that provider, uh, vendors will do. It's going to say they're really close together. I think I can now associate this wired device to this wireless air I see over here and I say, that's a problem. That's not associated properly. That's not trusted. And that gives you the ability to suppress it with DOF fire or deassociation fire. So that's kind of what the Rogue AP is talking about here. And I just want to make sure we clarify that. Yep, and I just want to shout out to M. Brown here. We are coming up on our best practices configuration for enterprise. Ooh. So, Sam, again, we've mentioned Sim throughout this talk. You still have to centralize and aggregate data as it flows in and out of your systems, in and out of your um, switching infrastructure, routers, firewalls, all this stuff, right? you got to centralize this logging. Is it awful to configure? Yes. Is it hard to alert properly? Is it yes. Turn, is it turnkey? <laughs> Always, right? How much does that cost? A hundred thousand dollars, a service account with DA? Done. Service account with DA. Yes. Leave it. Can I just pay you, and that's it? Uh, turn. Don't just log. You have to review. You have to react. Things like Splunk can be extremely granularly configured, right? These things can alert you on very important things. Are we interested if someone authenticates to our outside portal? Probably more than if someone fails to authenticate to our outside portals. Um, do this, we care? This sounds if, like an FTE. No, no, we like don't we need any more people. employers. Yes, and John is right. Splunk is a nightmare, but it can be configured very granularly. If you've got a million alerts every day, you're not doing it well. Yes. So, 80 best practices. Kent loves this stuff. This is where he came from. <laughs> I, I do. And here's the thing. If anyone's not running Active Directory right now, you can just not listen for a few minutes. If you are, however, OpenLDAP <laughs> still requires very similar naming conventions and file structures and permissions and group functional membership. Even if you're using G Suite, you should probably listen to part of this, I guess. Uh, the point <laughs> being is in Salt Lake City, we said who's using AD, and no one didn't raise their hand. So it's the point to be made <laughs> that didn't raise their hand. Yes. <laughs> uh, Yes, Active Directory is for hackers, right? It makes it easy. <laughs> so, OK, here's the thing. You want to make Active Directory so it's secure and functional and easy to use. If you do those things, it becomes a lot easier. And it really reduces your overhead, too. So things like naming conventions matter. Whether or not you have user groups named based off of what they do or have a specific naming convention to them, like USR underscore or SEC underscore. SVC underscore. Absolutely. Do I have a service account, right? Absolutely. Service accounts, start with them with SVC underscore and make sure that you're not giving them DA because you don't know what permissions they have. No, go back to the vendor and say, what permissions specifically do they need to have? Don't just give them DA because it works. Because, yeah, that'll work. <laughs> uh, functional roles. Um, if I am in marketing, I don't need to have access, yes, access to stuff in accounting. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> you know, what we're talking about here is lowest It's privilege. part of growing up. It is part it's, of growing up. It's hard. Yeah. Growing up is hard. It's it is. Awkward. It's hard to tell marketing. You don't need access to the accounting files anymore. Yes, and it's funny that John knocks Active Directory <laughs> all the time. <laughs> he also makes us manage all of the Active Directory labs we have around here. <sighs> okay, so group membership comes in the same way. Uh, LSDOU. If you don't know what that is, go look it up really quick. LSDOU. It talks about how you can group and nest your memberships in Active Directory where you can essentially give a user one group membership. With that group membership, it gives one, right? Their job functional role. And with that one, they now have access to do everything that their job needs access to do. Um, it also means that you can prevent access for certain things based off that job function. Um, so when you have a new employee, you give them one group membership, which is their job functional role for the area that they're working in. And then you don't need to deal with it anymore. And if they come back saying, I need more access, that's a key indication that you need to go back and look at the membership that that person has because what are they doing that they need access that everybody else doing their job didn't need access to? And it's a way to kind of build a bubble around their job to make sure that they're doing what they need to do and not well, going out of their lane to do things otherwise that they don't need to. Oh, well, true, true. And if they get fish, they can't destroy the whole thing. And they don't have DA. <laughs> the only thing that will burn down is their bubble. <laughs> 
and all the other job groups. Okay, here's so now, so, yeah, right. We got isolated workstations, and their firewalls better be up. Our OU structure matters. You know where people sit in the containers, so that we can properly deploy our upcoming TLS and PKI for our laptops. Right, they shouldn't be in the same containers as our workstations. Our servers should be split. App servers, you've got to, there's a whole lot here. Go ahead, sir. Someone right I know now, you're excited. Someone right now is saying, I thought this was a talk about wireless. Why are you talking about group policy? We are, and that's the thing, is that we doing, mean. if you tell someone right now you're going to defend wireless by turning on some devices on their firewall, that's not enough. It's not. And when I said we want to balance the really difficult part um, of getting stuff secured, but also the productivity of your users and not destroy the productivity, this is why this all comes into scope. By using things like Active Directory best practices and all these other things we've talked about, you're able to increase your security without uh, destroying your productivity. We'll let's move forward here. And let's since we assumed compromise, right, we have also okay. limited damage once someone did get popped. Okay, so. Which happens. Absolutely. So think about what about infrastructure? We've just talked about a bunch of tools and protocols and a bunch of things like that that are baseline to what we're doing. Let's talk about a couple scenarios right now about infrastructure. How is your network actually set up that can make it more secure without destroying that productivity? Uh, we're going to give a couple options right here, and I wish someone's going to say something about Romania right now. That is a road checkpoint. We're building checkpoints in the network to check for data, <laughs> access that data, look at it, and tell you whether or not it's good. It is a border. It's a perimeter. Yes. Absolutely. Strong Wi-Fi basics. Okay, in both these scenarios, I want you to look at a couple different things. 802.11 AC. What that means is that for someone to connect to the network, they have to have their own little uh, account and user permission to do that. So in this case, typically like an Active Directory user account with a password combined together gets you access to your Wi-Fi. We've also assumed that we have strongly configured our wireless infrastructure using WIDS, IPS, rogue AP detection, suppression, and the things that our logging devices care about and can inform me as a blue team defender when bad things are going on. Make sure you have your Active, Direct, Active Directory best practices set up. Make sure no, that uh, user accounts don't have more permissions than they need. If you have a service account, don't just give a DA. Don't give someone local uh, access, local administrative access on their workstation just because they need to install a print driver. These are things that can be set up that you don't need to give administrative access to. Limit that. Talk about least privilege that's necessary. We're talking about multiple perimeters. Make sure accounting and marketing workstations can't talk to each other. More than that, make sure your workstations are not on the same network as your servers. At the same time, <laughs> make sure if you connect to wireless, you're not getting connected to the server network. And then again, LMNR, MBS, Landman, all those should be disabled. If you're in a scenario that disabling them breaks something, you need to go back and figure out why, because these are technologies that are old and they're legacy. They should be disabled by now. And if they're not, you've got some application out there that probably needs to be updated as well. And, <laughs> and, and back to Philippe's question, right? We, we left NAC out because it's a very difficult blue team win to do right. It's difficult politically, right, to get through your executives. It costs lots of money. It's not easy to deploy, manage, administer over time. And these are easy wins that we can be doing now. All right. Um, <laughs> one. Uh, no refrigerators, HVAC, light bulbs, SCADA, or sewing machines. Okay, here's why I bring this up. <laughs> here's why I bring this up. Okay, refrigerators. It's really cool to have Netflix on your refrigerator. I can sit at the dinner table in the lunchroom and watch Netflix. It's cool. Here's the problem with that. Um, say say uh, the next vulnerability comes out for your refrigerator. That means someone has to go with their UB, USB stick and plug it into the back of the refrigerator by the water filter. And they have to actually like manage and control that. There's right? no yeah. reason to have a refrigerator on the network, right? But Netflix. <laughs> Not Netflix, music. Pandora, yeah. Calendars. So our scenario one, this is our strong scenario one. It gets worse. It does get worse. We deploy 802.1x across the network, and we authenticate all users and validate certificates. Certificates matter. So in internal CA, deployed certificate to all supplicants that we will allow on our network, right? This is very difficult to bypass, but not impossible, right? So then, again, using group policy, we have validated a strong configuration for all of our wireless supplicants. Connecting drops us into a container that allows us outbound internet only. Nothing internal, right? We have to assume these users get compromised because that's what happens. Then we allow some kind of access back into our network, whether it's VPN or who knows, something else. Absolutely. And, and what's key to note here is when I talked about productivity and that balance, what's really cool is you're talking about a group policy that's going to go on the workstation. And what that's going to do is if you're connected, if you're logged in with username and password on that workstation and it sees this wireless network, 
boop, it's going to pop on. And it doesn't require the user to have to type in their pre-shared key or for the help desk, anyone who calls the help desk, it's going to utilize that session on that workstation to connect to that wireless network if it's needed. All right, so Wi-Fi access, what that looks like. The strong one. The strong one, yes. So scenario two. Then this is a little bit different, and I want you to hear me out here because this can be done. It's not painful for the user, but it most definitely can be painful for uh, the, the sysadmins that are setting this up. So here's how. 802.1x radius to AD limited to a Wi-Fi OK computer group. You're no longer saying it's OK for a user to be connected to the network. You're saying it's OK for the device to be connected to the network. A GPO pushing the Wi-Fi supplicant to that workstation so that when it's connected, sorry, when it's in the vicinity of that wireless uh, with the specifically here certificate, the correct certificate that is trusted by the DA, or sorry, the domain CA, um, it will connect. What that means is that the workstation has a GPO, it's got the supplicant, but the supplicant says, only connect to this wireless network that I trust, the DC, the domain trust. If the wireless network cannot produce you this certificate, do not trust and do not connect. Okay, I'm going to stop you there. This is what hung us up when we were working on the blue team talk. Yes. H how's your time? <laughs> yes, absolutely. You have nine minutes. I have Go. nine minutes. All right, so we're going to keep going. I'm talking about the time you left on the certificates when we were trying to configure ah. 802.1x <laughs> machine authentication in the middle of the night. Yes. It's the little things. Anyway, we kind of got held up trying to produce a reasonable blue team defense set. To give you an idea what happened really quick, uh, we had a certificate that was issued for our lab and I issued it for the future. Uh -huh. So like it, everything would have worked great at the talk the following day because my workstation that I was using had the time of the, uh, the following day. Just make sure the time is right on your workstations. It was a, it was a silly mistake. <laughs> we should move forward. <laughs> Onward. <laughs> Onward, better, strong Wi-Fi, network access. So the point here is that, yeah, you got connected to the internet only. You got connected to the wireless that your interface has, it's internet only, but I need access to the servers. Okay, great. Once you're connected to the network, what we need to look at then is a VPN that connects from your wireless, untrusted, remember, untrusted network to your server network, to your resource network, to the wireless printers, whatever. Two-factor? Two-factor, yeah. Got to be two-factor, right? Absolutely. So what we're looking at here is saying, yeah, you connected to your untrusted wireless network, but now I need you to connect to the VPN over here and that gets you access to the, to the wired network that you're typically used to in the environment. Um, that VPN, the endpoint creds for it, should be your username and password for Active Directory, or can be, I should say. And yeah, absolutely, use dual auth. You're making it so that when someone sets up an evil, uh, evil access point, they can't just steal your Active Directory creds because you don't want that. Um, you're making it very difficult to do that. And again, create a GPO that pushes this VPN policy so that when someone needs access to these resources, it just automatically says, pops up, oh, you can connect to the wireless, or excuse me, to the VPN network and done. Yeah, or the route. Uh, the, the route statement could be clarified a little bit here where we re, we ran a WWA wireless, uh, Wild West Hack and Fest capture the flag last year. And one of the hints was a route gets added to your system by DHCP. So what we are saying here is if you don't authenticate as a machine to this wireless network, you don't get the route for vpn.corp.org or so on and so forth. And, and more specifically in that, you don't have to necessarily provide it a route that goes in the route table. We're saying use the 000 route that's already existing and put it on your gateway. And tell that gateway that these wireless devices can connect to the VPN, they can access the VPN, but it's going to be at an IP address that is not on the same LAN as them. And what that means is you have to route that traffic, but it also means on that workstation, you don't know the VPN exists unless you know it exists. An outsider cannot look at that and be like, oh yeah, I think you have to get on the VPN. Its IP address is here. I know that because I sniffed the traffic. You can't do any of that because your traffic is encrypted. We don't have client isolation turned off. <laughs> I said that backwards right almost. <laughs> so the point being there is, yeah, have a VPN, VPN endpoint to get to that trusted network after you're connected to the untrusted Wi-Fi. And all of that is really possible. It's not that difficult. And you can train your users that I connected to Wi-Fi, but all Wi-Fi means is internet. What I really need to do is now connect, connect to the Wi-Fi, connect to that VPN tunnel so my, my data is double encrypted. And you will have people bitching and moaning about it, wow. but they'll get used to it. You can yeah. train them. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's just getting used to it. it, it there's just this men mentality that I connect the wireless network, so how come I can't access the printers or the servers? And Or the file shares. Or the file shares. Or the domain controller. And you need <laughs> <laughs> with DA creds. The point being is that you need to look <laughs> at that, <laughs> and if you tell your users, yeah, that's not good enough. We connected to your device, but there are some security issues there. We need you to also connect to this VPN. And in today's age, you hear VPN everywhere. People are already 
used to understanding what a VPN is and how it works, or at least high level that I connect to the VPN to get to this network, to get to these resources. So it's not that much more difficult to have a laptop that automatically connects to the wireless. And on top of that, users now know, oh, I need to connect to the VPN like I would if I was working from home. So the, the gaps in doing that are not that difficult to make. Mm -hmm. It's time just, to start overcoming them as well. It is, absolutely. And the real the real headache no longer becomes uh, your end user group that are going to have to use these tools. It's going to become the sysadmins to set it up. And that's where you have to focus on, which is coincidentally a lot easier than dealing with the political side of getting it to your users. So uh, at our talk last time, we, we opened it up to discussions, and it was like crickets. We didn't have anybody talk to us. Mm -hmm. oh. You guys have been super awesome. It's your minute, so I can't even see the questions. But right, I don't know. Here's some you, need questions. Focus, you need to focus. Yeah, you're doing all right. We but, have. But basically, what we did after walking around downtown Salt Lake City for, I, I don't know, three hours, Sierra, thanks, shopping and wandering and whatever, like, carrying our like little. Five minutes of shopping in there. Little <laughs> postcard thing was we figured out what the most popular open wireless networks were in Salt Lake City. Then we called our boss to make sure that we could broadcast those networks. Yes, assuming we implement the postcard protocol. Postcard protocol says, just as sure as you mailing a postcard to your fiance, girlfriend, boyfriend, you have no reasonable expectation of privacy. I can read that as it passes me by and fine, whatever. Same thing goes for wireless networks. You connect to an open wireless network, here it is. So we spun some open wireless networks. And at one point during this, Talk, we had 57 clients or 67 connected to ATT Wi Fi, Xfinity Wi Fi, Free Wi Fi, Starbucks, things of that nature. It was a, it was a culinary conference um, beneath where we were sitting. So we figured that a bunch of chefs were connecting to our free Wi Fi. Awesome. <laughs> or not. So then we were interested in the traffic that flowed through those devices from a very high level perspective. We captured no packets, we did nothing interesting. We simply allowed the firewall to review things as they flowed through. And so then we see things like this, right? Which is Citrix. Somebody authenticated here. Is it you, Sierra, maybe? You on Citrix somehow, some way? Do we have Citrix somewhere? Yeah, that's, Citrix that's go to webinar. Yeah. One of us is on wireless. Oh yeah. <laughs> Citrix I owns go to webinar of course they do. I am. Uh, Microsoft, right? So we see some interesting things. Anyway, just it is what it is. Uh, so again, we used uh, that open wireless uh, SSIDs to build this out, and that's how we captured so many, uh, captured? Uh, we associated so many stations to our free internet, free internet that was monitored. <laughs> <laughs> so Food, yes, we didn't get good. Hey, so we had these other questions, um, but yes. before we do answer, there's a couple questions I wanted to go back to, but we, before we do, uh, the first winner is Alan Stone. Alan, if you were on, let us know and then send me your size and your address to sierra at bhas.co and I will send you a shirt. But Alan doesn't seem to be replying, so Alan doesn't look like he's on. Um, the next person is Kristen or Chris, sorry, Chris with a K. I guess Crower. We didn't all we didn't really talk about devices and wandering, right? So if your phones have associated to these networks, they will connect automatically without you knowing. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Like the Sam. The, see who's got a Samsung here? Not me. Oh, <laughs> Fred the Jones. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Dave had a question. Swing, so, please. Going back to, um, are there any WIDS or WITS? The, oh. oh, so they we we so don't have. You can recommend for home something without an enterprise price tag. Sure, you're you're still gonna have to look at Cisco owning Linksys, right? So you have to assume at some point in their product lines pricing model, one of them will have WIDS IPS. You're just gonna have to look at the boxes and see what features are supported by those devices that you buy them. Okay, um, and then... Cisco doesn't own Linksys. Don't they? Cisco Linksys? Can somebody Google that for us? Mark Zuckerberg, uh, you said <laughs> yes. you said your Facebook stock is down. Um, yes, we can clarify the DHCP round hidden gateway. Um, I will do that in the blog post that's associated with this just for uh, uh, convenience of time. Okay. Um, Philippe, what do you think about Ubiquity Unify product line um, for Wi-Fi security? I like 
Ubiquity, though, there's a problem that someone is investigating at our company that may be uh, worthy of note. Um, I'm not sure if it's been disclosed to them, so we're not allowed to disclose anything, though that's just what we do as a business, is we try to go through the proper channels, though. We like Ubiquity a lot, and we use it in labs, and we use it in testing, and we use it randomly throughout our wanderings across the globe. But remember, next next-gen toilet paper is not enough. <laughs> you can't just buy the next next gen. You, you have it's to. Just toilet paper. It's just toilet paper. I know. <laughs> you have thing. to have toilet paper, but that's not always enough. Belkin owns Linksys. Now, okay, ten four. Thank you for that, BB. Appreciate it. Thirteen. Uh, okay. Time ashamed, <laughs> but I haven't kept up with vendor stuff. Anything else? Um. 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 Does Fortinet have a software distro of 48 for testing? Does I can't answer that. I don't know. I know some people have ported Cisco gear into things like GSE. and They do have uh, Fort OS on, on virtual instances. So uh, go to Fortinet.com, get a demo. They'll, they'll gladly, help, gladly help you out. Um, we I talked to uh, our Fortinet rep for the webcast saying, hey, we want to demo some of the stuff inside the webcast. They gave us a thumbs up and said, go do it. Um, we just need to say we don't resell, so don't call us looking for Fortinet equipment. That's <laughs> not what we do. Um, and we never got an answer from um, the first two. So the next name is Anthony Mirando. If you are on, let me know. Um, and John Davis. So there you go. If you are, is this for a T-shirt? Yeah. John Davis. John Davis. Anthony. Anthony Wait. Do you know these people? I think it's time to wrap. No, I don't. We're over. I'm on. Them. We got yeah, one. Anthony Woo! and Tom. Right. Um, okay. Sorry, Casey. But next time, next time. Oh, and Chris, you got it. So email me your size and your address, and we will send those out. Sierra at blackhillsinfosec.com. Or and Sierra at bhs.co. With that, okay. I don't know I how to on. shut this down. Oh, I think yeah. We came up with a secret handshake. You're right. <laughs> you wish you could be cool. Terrible. Thank you all for spending <laughs> the last so hour of your lives with us. <laughs> we appreciate it. Blue teams, and let's win. Our yes. next webcast actually is next week. So it's a quick turnaround with John. So it's a kind of a bonus webcast, but I'll send you that information soon. Anyway, thanks, Philippe. Thanks, we appreciate thanks being, being here. You guys are awesome. Thank yeah, you. you Cheers, bye -bye. guys. Ciao.